Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Welcome uh, to our next uh, Dev Talk. Today we have James uh, McCaffrey from the Microsoft Research Advanced Development Team. Uh, James uh, joined Microsoft uh, around 97, and he has worked on several groups from Exchange, uh, Internet Explorer, and Bing. Um, and then he moved to MSR starting in 2010. Um, he holds a doctorate from USC on mathematics and cognitive psychology. And he's also the senior contributing editor to MSDN Magazine. So if you want to write for MSDN Magazine, he's the guy to talk to. And with that, I'll give it over to James. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, James, like I said. Uh, first of all, the, the ground rules. Um, this is uh, supposed to be a more along the lines of a college lecture type thing, where the main goal is to uh, transfer knowledge type of things and have this presentation uh, useful as a resource. Um, you can ask questions at any time. I have roughly uh, a dozen slides or so. Each one should take about a minute. Uh, with uh, uh, In between, I expect the talk to take about 30 minutes. Uh, so here we go. We're already on uh, slide number two. Um, the agenda is I'm going to uh, describe data clustering a little bit. Now, I, I bet you you all have a rough idea of what clustering is, but I'm going to uh, try to define it more formally and also sort of give us, uh, get us into the mood of thinking about data clustering. And then, uh, really, there's two primary topics, clustering numeric data and clustering non-numeric data. Um, each of those will have a demo, and then at the end, we'll have some resources. Um, I'd say the main uh, content of this talk will be th three demos, and I will point you to complete source code at the end. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I guess uh, before I leave the agenda, motivation and goals. Um, the goals are uh, fairly uh, lofty in the sense that regardless of your background, now I'm going to make no assumptions about your background, whether you're a developer, PM, or, or anything like that. Um, but uh, the goal is for you to leave having all the resources you need, uh, assuming that you have uh, developer skills, to uh, actually implement a uh, production quality uh, clustering uh, with at least uh, three different uh, algorithms and have enough knowledge to customize it. Um, one of the things that we'll see is that clustering, you can't just drop it in. It's not uh, one algorithm fits all. They all need to be slightly uh, tuned. So here we go. Okay, yes, Rob? You'll be discussing why and when we should choose a particular algorithm? Yeah, pretty much. Um, it, what we'll see is the question was uh, describe when and why to use a particular algorithm. I think that's one of the main things in any talk is, you know, we have too many tools sometimes, and the real question is, like, when do we use a particular tool? So I'll try to address that, and if I don't, be sure to call me on it. Is it, is it more importantly, is there, so... My assumption is that us as developers writing software to solve a given problem, we're going to decide which one is best based on what you're going to be telling us. Is, is that yeah. Correct? It, it turns out it's not as hard a problem as you'd see because certain types of problem constrain you to certain algorithms. Uh, so it'll, it'll be pretty easy. Okay, so here's our what is data clustering, and I see uh, my boss sitting in the audience. So, boss. Uh, impress us by telling us how many clusters there are here. Uh, probably at least three. <laughs> he says three in his accent, and he is correct. So we have this intuitive idea of what clustering is, but we want to formalize it and write some code. Now, this is pretty obvious that there's three clusters, and the cluster membership is fairly obvious, too. Um, this will be uh, the, the data for the first demo called uh, k-means uh, clustering. And these data have two... Uh, dimensions, height and weight, height in inches and weight in pounds. Can anybody speculate? So we've got two dimensions here. And the only reason why we're using two dimensions is it makes it easy to visualize. Okay? Uh, can anyone speculate on a third dimension? If each data row or tuple represents a person, what's another dimension that we could have included? Age. Age. Excellent. Anybody else? Sex. Sex. 
level of Okay, sex is the one I was hoping for. <laughs> that didn't come out quite right. But what I meant was, <laughs> when, we, um, when we look at a data clustering problem, uh, problems fall into three distinct buckets. Those in which the data is totally numeric like this. So uh, se uh, we could add age, but we couldn't add sex because that's a categorical variable. There are types of problems that are purely categorical, okay, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And then there's type with uh, uh, mixed data, okay. So one of Rob's question was, uh, when do you know when to use a particular algorithm? That's the first thing you'll do is identify the type of data. All numeric, all categorical, or mixed. Um, now this next uh, slide just shows, I guess my point here is, uh, don't underestimate the power of visualizing the data before you start. Um, this is the exact same data, but without the visualization. And uh, I would defy you, even now, you know, even from the previous slide, to try to imagine how many clusters there are. So uh, data visualization can be very powerful uh, pre-processing stage. Uh, now this one, the point is this is uh, similar data, except I uh, rearranged it. This one, it's not at all obvious how many clusters there are or how the data should be clustered. And um, this is the type of problem. This is where uh, programmatic uh, data clustering comes in handy. In fact, I stared at this quite some time before the talk, and I, I was wondering if, I, if someone really did ask me to cluster the data, I'm not sure how I'd do it. it. To me, it sort of appears I kind of can imagine two kind of ovals, one here and one here but it's likely that everybody might come up with a different type of clustering. Now here's a, uh, another example to, to reemphasize. This type of data is purely categorical, al although not really. You've got to be very careful about this. Um, and we'll, we'll describe how you would uh, uh, tackle clustering this. Now this, I mean, th we're actually going to do this. What's your immediate, there, there's weird psychology that often goes on in clustering. What's your first impression on how you would cluster this data? Well, no, no I, by um, not the technique, but just looking at it, how would you divide it up? By the way, clustering is equivalent to partitioning. You know, I mean, mathematicians would call it partition because you're just, you've got the data and you have to divide it up into a partition to chunks. You pick one of the, one of the values. Yeah, in, pick one of the columns. In particular, though, I guarantee you that all of you in the room are going to pick the same one, which is color. color. I don't know why. Um, I've asked many people this thing, and color just seems like a natural thing. Well, it turns out that that's not the best way to cluster this data. And I also said that this is purely categorical. That's not entirely true. Look closely at the data. I mean, it is categorical, but one of the columns is inherently different. How is that so? Okay, one's binary. Now, in machine learning, that's often a big deal, but that's not a big deal for clustering. I'm sorry? There's an ordering to size. Exactly. Could you repeat that a little louder? There's an ordering to size. There's an ordering to size. Um, in other words, we could say, what's the difference between red and blue? Oh, I don't know. But compare the difference between short and medium versus short and long. We would expect, assuming that those things somehow are representative of <laughs> underlying numbers. Um, so you just got to be careful with that. I don't have any great words of wisdom other than uh, Pay attention to the data. The first step in clustering is to analyze the type of the data. Um, so here's just sort of a summary of what we just talked about. Uh, data clustering is uh, surprisingly difficult to formalize. You know, to actually come up with a definition uh, that you can use to uh, run an algorithm against. But typically, most clustering, uh, you know, clustering is typically a dual objective. In the case of the numeric data that we saw, um, I won't go back to it, but basically we all saw three clear clusters. But if I asked you to articulate why those were clearly the clusters, you'd have to think about it for a while. And you'd say something like, well, the dots in one cluster are close together. But also, the second objective typically is that there's a lot of space, empty space, between clusters. So you ha it's a dual min, uh, min max problem. You want to uh, minimize the distance in a cluster and maximize the distance between clusters, which makes it kind of a difficult problem mathematically. Oh, now here's one of my um, thing. Uh, th this uh, talk is uh, titled Data Clustering for Developers. 
So we're going to explicitly try to not mention much theory. But an important theoretical notion for clustering is there isn't one measure of clustering. There's many different measures of clustering. And for almost anyone that you can come, I'm sure there must be some weird exceptions. I haven't seen any. But if you come up with a definition of clustering, the problem is NP hard. Now, as developers, assuming that we're all developers here in the audience, uh, we hear NP hard, we hear NP complete, and we hear NP this, that, and the next thing. Now, most of us, uh, these do have formal definitions, but from a developer's point of view, I always try to translate this in my head. If something is NP hard or NP complete, what that means from a developer's point of view is that the only way to get the best answer is to iterate through every possible combination. Okay? And in the case of clustering, this has the exponential growth problem. It's not doable for all but trivial problems. Even when you get to something like 50 items in two partitions, it becomes uh, unimaginably large. So NP hard translation, no matter what measure you pick, you're not going to be able to come up with an algorithm that will guarantee the optimal solution. So that means we have to rely on heuristics uh, often. Um, this we already mentioned. Uh, the type of data are different, have to be handled differently. The number of clusters will often be problem dependent. I'll say this now before I forget because uh, it, it's not anywhere in my slide. Um, if you read the literature or Wikipedia, by the way, Wikipedia is really good for a lot of things, but for most machine learning topics it's really weak and for clustering it's really weak. Um, take all the Wikipedia stuff on clustering with a grain of salt. Um, but you'll go in and read uh, any of the research papers and say the number of clusters, the, uh, there's two kinds of algorithms. Those where you have to supply the number of clusters up front and then the algorithm runs and those that determine automatically the number of clusters. Well, I consider that kind of a hoax because what they don't say is those algorithms that do determine the number of clusters, you have to supply different information that acts as a surrogate. For instance, some measure of a bounding box or something like that, which implicitly uh, determines the number of things. But anyway, the number of clusters, there isn't some magic way to determine how many clusters there should be. So again, this is just reiterating. The two key things in any clustering algorithm is defining what, what a good clustering is and then searching through all combinations because, or finding a way to efficiently search the combinations. Um, data, this is sort of some of the common uses of data clustering and I have a last minute addition to this uh, in a second uh, from uh, somebody in the building. But one way to do it is uh, for ad hoc data exploration, if you have data and this would be typically SQL Server data that has some sort of, I don't know what, how to describe it exactly, but it'd be like sales data or transaction log data. The data has meaning in itself. You can cluster it to do ad hoc exploration, just find interesting patterns, okay? Um, on the other hand, and also that would, same thing, identify abnormal data points, and I'll, I'll show you that later. Another thing is that data clustering is used more often, I think, um, as part of other machine learning algorithms. So in other words, you'll, you'll be going along, in particular I was working with radial basis function networks the other day, and you're going along and part of that algorithm is group the data together to find representative data vectors. Okay? So uh, data clustering can be used sort of as a top level tool or internally to some uh, machine learning algorithm. Now here's my last one here, and this is a, a pure opinion, which I'm not shy about spouting ever. Um, I think that, or I would consider that machine learning has three hello world problems. And um, presumably one of the reasons why you're sitting here and listening uh, today is that it seems like every time we turn around for a company meeting uh, or anything, um, we're hearing about machine learning machine uh, more and more. And in fact, I remember working years ago I'd heard about machine learning, but I probably never really used it. But now I'd say the majority of things that I work on use machine learning in some way. So k-means is one of the three hello worlds, and I'd say, I'd claim the pure opinion, but I'd say that the other two are, hope I can remember these, um, logistic uh, regression, uh, binary classification, and naive Bayes classification. That's an uh, opinion. So anyway, knowing this, no one k-means sort of is uh, one of your membership cards into the club of machine learning, maybe. 
Does anyone have an opinion on that? Because that's opinion like, oh, I don't care. I mean, do you, do you care? Or are you like, no, that's totally not true? Or no? Sounds good. Sounds good. OK, good. What a, what a docile crowd. I was expecting a, a little bit more feistiness. OK. Um, so basically, where we're at now in the grand scheme of things, I'll read it. We're going to talk about what data clustering is, walk through three specific algorithms. Here's uh, the k-means algorithm, um, which is probably one of the most famous in all machine learning. If I had to pick one, I'd say it is the most famous. Luckily, it's simple and elegant. Now, there's different names for it because it's been around for a long time. In fact, I stumbled across, while preparing this talk, I st actually stumbled across a research paper. That's the history of the k-means algorithm. So there's research on the research of k-means. It goes on and on. Um, it's sometimes called Lloyd's algorithm, and it's also associated with another researcher named McQueen. Um, but we'll just call it k-means. So this is the same data as before, and here it is. The, the algorithm couldn't be any simpler, but we'll see that you've got to be careful. It goes like this. Initialize the data to clusters. So what we'll do first is take the data and assign each data point to an arbitrary cluster. Now, we know in advance that there's three, so we'll just pretend that we knew that. Okay? Then, compute the mean of each of these clusters, and then update the cluster assignments based on new means. Now, it's, it's kind of difficult to visualize, so I harnessed my PowerPoint skills here. Okay, so here we go. So here's step one, initializing the data to clusters. I've just colored in, I picked uh, one of three colors, and the color represents a uh, cluster assignment. Okay. You do that randomly, right? Yes, and in fact, I'll jump ahead and say that the initialization is critical. We know that we're not going to get, we're not guaranteeing to find an optimal, an optimal solution, and our final solution depends entirely on the initialization. It's totally deterministic after this point. So the initialization is key, and we'll come back to this. Um, now, the next thing is we're going to compute the means. So by that, I mean, you should be able to visualize this. Um, imagine the red dots. Now, the mean of a vector is just simple. You just take the average of each individual component. So where would the, the center of mass of the red ones be? So I'll mo move my fist and tell me when I'm getting close to the center of mass of where the red ones are. Yeah, in fact, if you look at it, you can see the reds are slightly to the left of center, but pretty much centered, so you'd expect the, the mean right there. So you can do that mathematically. And likewise, I sort of faked the initialization so that the, uh, the mean of the yellows is right smack in the middle, and the mean of the greens is slightly up and to the right. So if you calculated them, you would get that. Now notice that the means, and this is why this is called k means. k is the number of clusters, and we have three means. Notice that the means do not correspond to an actual data point. They're sort of like a hypothetical data points. Now there are variations of this called uh, k metoid, where the k metoid was instead of computing means, you'd compute the most representative actual piece of data. But that's just sort of like a sideline. Okay, now. So we just computed the means. Now we update the cluster assignment, and this is sort of the key, this is the performance bottleneck of the whole thing. By the way, one of the reasons why k-means is popular and used, it, it's easy to take pot shots at k-means in research. Oh, we can improve k-means. K-means, oh, it's, yeah, like, oh, I studied that in, in you know, my data structures class. Well, that's true, but one of the reasons why it's still around is it's good. It's fast and it's efficient. It's, Typically, I'd call it the baseline against which all others are compared. But now, we're going to walk through, here's the performance ball now. We take each point and determine which mean it's closest to. So this point down here, what color uh, mean is it closest to? Red. Clearly red. What about this? Red. red, 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 red. And these ones are going to be pretty much yellow, yellow, yellow. Then right here, green, green, and so forth. But if you walk through that, now notice that that's going to be order magnitude n, where is the number of data points. It's actually n times k. What you do is you take this first point, compute the distance to each of the three means, and then assign it to the uh, cluster uh, that is the shortest distance. And you get that. Uh, and then, now we uh, loop back up and we compute new means. Um, where would the mean of the reds be? Going to go down there, the mean of the yellow is up there, and the mean of the green's right there. 
And then the next step, we're back up. We compute the, uh, where are we at? We just compute new means. So we update the clustering assignment, and we get that. And in fact, you can see that we've converged. At this point, there would be no change in cluster assignments. The new means, this would move over a little bit, this would move in there, that would move down there. But then, when we reassign, there'd be no uh, new cluster assignments, and the algorithm would stop. The done is true. So it's, it's almost too easy, especially when you see sort of a uh, little uh, animation. So here's the, uh, here's the demo. And I know you're going to be impressed. There it is, OK? No. Um, so this is the actual data, and there's really not much to see here. Um, here's the raw data. I am going to show you now, I, I really, when I'm uh, sitting in an audience, I really hate it when the presenter shows code. Because really, to me, that's, a, you know, show me, you know, just give me a pointer. I want to look at the code by myself later. But I am going to call out a few key things, not the details of the code, but high-level uh, artifacts of the code. So we set the number of clusters. It, it's k-means is usually very fast. Um, and here's the result of clustering. You have to have some way to represent the clustering. And there's no, you know, there's, there's many different ways to do this. But here, I'm representing the clustering as an array where the invisible indices down below, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, are the indices of the data tuples, and the values represent the cluster ID. Okay? Um, that's pretty efficient. Okay, now let me uh, show you the code. Well, first of all, here's the code, and it's not very long, uh, which is a good thing. You know, I'm a big believer in short and simple is better than long and complicated when it comes to any kind of code. Um, here's our raw data, and here's the clustering uh, method itself. There's really only about 10 lines. Um, this code, I'll point you to it, but I, I probably overdid it on the, uh, on the comment, commenting. You know, sometimes you add comments, it makes it harder to read. Um, and that was, I was a little bit paranoid. Knowing that, my peers are going to be looking at the code, you know, you go, oh, I better really, really comment the heck out of this thing. Um, now, the first thing here is, I'll claim in a, in a slide in a second, that I researched as much as I could looking at every available k-means implementation on the internet. You know, um, well, what are the, some of the you know, developer sites? I, I can never remember. Stack something. Overflow. Stack Overflow and CodePlex and this and that. I could not find one that I felt was 100% accurate. And uh, um, the errors uh, fell into two categories. Number one was the concept of normalization. Okay? Well, the first thing we do in this cluster is normalize the data. And that is, in our height and weight thing, our heights were in the neighborhood of 60, 65, but the weights were like double that, 130, 140. When you compute a distance, if you don't normalize the data, the, the column with the large values completely dominates the distance computation. Well, the, every, okay, everybody in this room, I just said that, and I guarantee you, Everyone goes, well, yeah, of course, obviously. But nobody seems to call that out. You mean, you have to normalize the data. So I'm assuming, my boss and I were talking about this the other day, and we're guessing that this was just sort of an assumption within the community. Well, that may be an assumption within the researcher community, but for the developer community, I think it needs to be explicit. Normalize the data. And you can either do that externally in a pre-processing step or internally here. What does normalize mean? Um, in this case, there, there's several kinds of normalizing. What I, what the specific normalization here is, you compute the mean of each column. So let's take the weights. Compute the weights and then translate the raw data into x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. You do that and each value, a value that's exactly the mean will be zero, normalized, and values that are lower than the mean will be like minus 1 or minus 1.5, and values greater are like plus 0.5. When you do this, in, except in really, um, well, uh, there's some word bizarre data, really pathological data, the values would be all between minus 10 and plus 10 regardless of the original scale. And for bell-shaped data, maybe you remember from your statistics, between minus 3 and plus 3. So anyway, you get the numbers all roughly the same so that something doesn't swamp them. That's called Gaussian normalization. It's explained in the code. There's alternatives. 
Um, now this, so I said I didn't find anything. So co correct. So the first thing was I, I just didn't see anybody uh, acknowledging the normalization issue. Then the second thing here is indicated by these two things here. Uh, or I'll, I'll go the update means. The, the danger, the programming danger, when you're actually implementing this thing is that it is possible, in fact, it's very possible during the course of the iterations for you to reach a point where a cluster has no data assigned to it. In other words, a cluster vanishes. Now, maybe you want that to happen, but probably not. So if you're going to code this, you have to be aware of that and prevent that. And this implementation does this. So we don't just update the means. We attempt to update the means. If updating the means, well, that actually happens in both places. It's, it's, it's a little bit tricky. But if at any point one of the update uh, means or clustering would result in a situation with a zero tuple cluster, then you bail out and stop there or throw an exception or something like that. Can't you have a situation also where um, you have a data point that flips back and forth between two different clusters and you wind up in a different loop or something like that? That is possible. So the question was, is it possible for you to not converge by having a data point flip-flop back and forth? Um, all of these things are possible. It's very rare. But that can happen, especially when you're computing the distances. If you get a point that is exactly, exactly halfway between exactly halfway, and you don't have some uh, mechanism for always going one way or the other, then that can happen. So the answer is yes, it can happen. OK, so that, uh, that is that demo. Let's go back to PowerPoint. We're roughly uh, halfway done here. A little bit more than halfway done, I think. So, were you varying k in that demo, or were you starting out always calling it three? That k was three. So, I guess I might as well address now. So, like, how do you know? How do you choose k? Um, there, there's some research on it. None of it is very convincing. My approach is to do as follows: is when you you, you do a cluster, but you can also return a value for k means that represents how good the clustering is. And that would be, consider a metric like the average distance within a group. So you'd want small numbers. And or the average distance between means. You would want that as large as possible. So you can have some kind of measure of how good the clustering is. And it's basically trial and error. Try two, three, two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, and so forth. There's no approach that basically looks at the goodness of the clustering and then modifies k and goes again as a formalized algorithm. Uh, no, I mean, you could do that yourself, but it's a little bit uh, uh, dicey. Actually, if you use the minimum distance, it will convert to the number of points. Yes, exactly. You've got to be... Uh, you the, um, you've got to be very careful. See, if there was such a way, people would use it. And I, I fell into that trap early on where you just go, oh, Let's just minimize it, and then poof, everything just collapses. Uh, you, it, you can actually make it collapse both ways, where everything falls down to one giant cluster, or everything expands to one point per cluster. So it's not as easy as you might think. Um, good point. Thank you for mentioning that. OK, so why code your own? Well, the, the normal arguments uh, apply. Um, but in particular with k-means, I haven't found any, I say many web implementations, buggy. Now, they, I mean, they work, but they, have a, they don't address the normalization or the singularity of empty clusters. Um, you can customize the initialization, as was mentioned earlier. You, you know, once you get things going, it's uh, deterministic. So you can do different uh, initialization schemes. Uh, the distance we used was Euclidean distance, but there's all kinds of distance measure. Manhattan distance, some other distance that I can never pronounce. It starts with an M, and it looks like an Indian name of some sort. Uh, but there's all kinds. Uh, metoids instead of means. Uh, you can customize the return value. In particular, in a lot of cases where k-means is used within a larger algorithm. You don't, you don't really care about the clustering, per se. You're looking for the means, those representative points. So you can return those instead. Um, an interesting thing here was that um, it's, this is almost a um, poster child 
for an algorithm that would benefit from the uh, uh, TPL, the Microsoft uh, C-Sharp Task Parallel Library. When you're updating uh, cluster assignments, they're all individual, and I mean, it's literally you just replace your for loop and poof, typically I get an uh, improvement, of, depending on all things, of about a, a speed improvement of times five, okay? And it's a very easy uh, speed up. And of course, copyright and licensing issues. Uh, now, um, I, I said I got a last minute thing. This was a very interesting. Um, uh, somebody, uh, um, well, actually, Alessandro Foran. Oh, that's you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was about to say <laughs> I hadn't met him before, uh, but he, um, uh, so great. Yeah, I'm about to butcher his presentation, but he sent me a really fascinating paper, <laughs> a really fascinating paper in progress that uses custom, they came up with a custom clustering algorithm. It's implemented in hardware, uh, field programmable gate array, um, and they came with their own thing that's blazingly fast because it's for connect, it has to be blazingly fast. And I only had a chance to read over it, but it looks very interesting. So I'll just say, well, first of all, he gratefully uh, said that if you're interested, you can contact them. But the paper looks great, and I'm going to read it. But this is the idea of practical uses, I think, of clustering, you know, as opposed to just clustering some SQL data, using it within a larger problem that involves machine learning. Okay, now, um, there's, a, uh, variation, there's many variations on the k-means algorithm. I think the most important one to me is called the fuzzy c-means uh, algorithm. Um, and imagine this data. It's almost the same as the original data, but what's different? Yeah, we have these two ambiguous points here. So if you look at this screenshot, what happens is fuzzy c-means, instead of k-means, which assigns you know, uh, cluster membership or not, this assigns a fuzziness. Now, I always think of fuzziness as a probability, which is completely wrong, okay? If you're a researcher out there, yes, I know. Fuzzy, uh, fuzziness is not a probability. It's really a measure of ambiguity, blah, 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 okay? But I still like to think about it as roughly meaning probability. And you can see that these two points clear to those. And here, these have high certainty that these points belong together and these have lower certainty. So the, the fuzzy, uh, I think, is quite interesting and it automatically gives you uh, sort of these outliers. You know, right away you can identify uh, outlier points that there's something different about these. And I'll show you the, uh, I'll just run the demo. Keep doing the paper. Can you rerun that with with the cluster of four, K4? Yeah, sure, I'll do that right now. Oh, I feel like the magician. Oh, yeah? Okay, show me with my deck of cards. <laughs> um, so, I'm just curious, though, no. does it assign this to, to, to a different cluster or not? Well, actually, in fact, I actually did that one. It's, it's very interesting what happens when you do four. So here's the, the call, and you can see it's quite easy. Um, we set the number of clusters here, but you have to supply an additional parameter. Um, they call the fuzziness factor. A fuzziness factor, it has to be greater than one, but if you put 1.001, well, I'll show you what happens. The larger the number is, the more fuzzy the assignments become. The less, you know, the, the numbers get smaller. But here, let's do uh, Rob's question first. And look what happens when we uh, say, okay, four clusters. Um, what happened here, here's the four clusters. Now, look at, here's the assignments, and it was, um, which point was it? It was six and seven. Six and seven. So it put them in. It, it, it's hard to see without the data. But what it, it didn't do what you would expect. I was expecting it to create its own cluster with those two points in. But what it did was it, it has sort of unexpected consequences on some of the other data. Okay? So I guess the moral story here is that there's a, a certain amount, with clustering, a certain amount of experimentation. I'll demonstrate one last thing here too, and that's one of the reasons why I kind of like fuzzy clustering is, let me do a fuzziness of 1.01, which is minimum. If you go to one, there's gonna be a division by a zero type thing. But if you make a fuzziness factor of one, observe what happens here. Essentially, it, I'm not sure what the word, devolves or converges or 
collapses into the normal k-means. Okay, so in other words, there's no fuzziness in this thing. So you get sort of like a, a freebie, so to speak. That makes sense. Well, what, what is, how do you compute fuzzing? Is it the distance? What? Well, here I'm going to show you now. Now, the, the next thing is, uh, Sandra asks, you know, well, where does that come from? It is a surprisingly... So I thought the same thing, you know, when I first ran across this, I go, oh, well, we'll just make it proportional to the distance, you know, further distance, more fuzzy, okay? Well, it turns out there's been a lot of research, and the algorithm that I uh, implemented and uh, have, well, post is called uh, BESDAX algorithm. Um, and it turns out it's not so simple at all, at, in fact, at all. Here is the, uh, whenever I do a, um, a uh, algorithm that involves data structures, I, I carefully draw this out. So this is the, the fuzzy C means uh, how it works. And I'm not going to go through here, but sadly, there, there's two things here. It, if you're just looking at, okay, yeah, I see a bunch of arrays and matrices and stuff, but I think in your hearts, you know, yeah, I could figure this out. Once I have this and I see the code, I'm going to match and I can see how I loop through it. But basically, um, there's nothing too fancy here. You just do uh, some matrix operations. The real problem in any of these clustering things is I went directly to the original source, and this is all you get. Okay, and they go, okay, this. Now, I work with, you know, summations. I'm an applied mathematician in my, in my school days. But even that, I go, oh, man, okay. And you have to laboriously try to figure out what does that actually mean in terms of code. Um, Here's the second half of the fuzzy C means where you have to do fancy footwork. And, and I saw this, oh, great. You know. But it becomes a little challenge. You have to figure out what does this mean and how do I implement it in code. Well, you can look at the code. So I hope that answers your question is that it's not totally obvious. I thought it was just going to be a simple uh, math mapping from distance to fuzziness, but it's not quite so simple. Yes, it is. It's, it, it's based on a power relationship. Yes? What happens if you have data that are um, kind of outside the bound, like somebody with a weight of zero or somebody with a height of eight feet? Does that start? Do you it, it depends. Uh, you mean with fuzzy or k-means or either? Uh, like for k-means. For k-means, so what happens, the question is, what happens if you have a really extreme outlier? Well, that is going to, because the Euclidean distance is really heavily influenced by outliers because the squared distance, that's going to really move the mean more than it probably should. And that's just going to affect things in hard to describe ways. But with the implementation here, one outlier can have a unduly large effect. So one of the, and I said one of the alternatives is, if you have data that is subject to that, you might want to use instead of the Euclidean distance, what's called the Manhattan distance, which is sort of the same thing, but you don't square it, and it doesn't penalize those huge outliers. So there's really no good answer. It's just, it, it just throws things out of whack. Well, normalizing, right? I mean, that still comes back to your... Yeah, normalizing does a lot to prevent that, but it doesn't totally eliminate that outlier effect. Unless you take the maximum, you reduce everything to zero to one. That's a, a, there's a different form uh, of normalization. Called, it's called max min, which do, deals better with those far outliers. Now, are you going to say, at this point, you know, you might be thinking, if I was sitting in the audience and I started here, I go, oh, wait a minute, it seemed pretty easy. Now there's this detail, and there's that detail, and there's the next detail. Don't get wrapped up with the details. Clustering is really pretty simple. And there are tons of details, but we run into tons of details all the time. And it's not, this is not one of those topics where, like neural networks, to effectively use a neural network, you have to know dozens of details to even make it work. But for clustering, the information I'm going to give you here today is going to make you dangerous with clustering. I mean, dangerously effective. OK, our last uh, topic uh, today is clustering categorical data. And Here's a claim. I, I'm hoping that someone in the audience will email me with a counter opinion. If you have numeric data, I claim k-means is the standard that everyone would try first. But with categorical data, I don't know of any standard way. Okay? So, in fact, if you search for this, you, you, you don't find a whole lot of solid information. 
the obvious approach of just converting string data to numbers doesn't work because uh, there's no inherent distance. The k-means relies on distance. Well, what's the difference between red and green? It, it just doesn't work. That has to be domain specific, right? I mean, there's got to be cases where some string data, like I'm thinking like, suppose yeah. you had colors represented in their RGB values. On right, the, right. I mean, now, you could probably do something with that, with clustering, right? And that's directly taking the color. You're absolutely right. In situations where the categorical data does represent magnitude, what you can do is then you can assign values to them uh, and use a numeric algorithm. So here I'm talking about purely categorical where there's just no meaning. There's labels of some sort. People's names would be a good one or text processing, you know, natural language processing type uh, uh, environments. Well, I stumbled across this thing called category utility. So there it is. Your initial reaction? Too many Greek letters. But your second reaction is, uh, okay, I will now prove using Zoltar's lemma, the upper bound on, no, I'm lying. I'm not gonna do all that at all. From a developer's point of view, this is what you see, what, what developer needs to know is what does it mean and how do I implement it? So, eh, I was gonna try to do a sound effect, but I didn't have one. So, category utility is a metric, it's a number that can be computed on a particular clustering of categorical data. So, you apply some code and it spits out a number. And larger numbers are better. And you'll just have to take my word on it. There's some deep research papers that I can point you to. And basically, you know, just doing a hand-waving argument, there's two main chunks here. This reads the probability that an attribute, like color, takes on some value, like red, given a particular clustering. So it's a probability. And over here, this is the probability that an attribute, like color, takes on the value without any clustering. So this thing represents information gain in some way. And the larger the number, the more information you've gained by the clustering. It's a very clever thing. So I saw that and, it, and I coded this thing. It's, it's my own uh, thing, but it seems to be very uh, effective. And really, the algorithm is right here. This is all you need. So we've got some measure of cluster goodness. So what you do is you start with no clusters, okay? And you take the first data tuple and figure out the category utility if you would assign it to each of the three clusters. And you just assign it to the one that gives you the highest number. Now you take the next data. Boom, next, next, next. So you run through it, each data once, and it's called greedy because you just assign it to the, tup to the cluster that gives you the best category utility. And it's called agglomerative because you start out with nothing, you build up the clustering, okay? So this is a common thing, these um, greedy agglomerative things. And it seems to work really well. There isn't a whole lot of research on it, but I did it for an earlier project, and it works as far as I'm concerned. And this one, I think I won't do the demo because you just see this, but basically, um, this is the data from the beginning. You set the number of clusters to three, and poof, it does like that. Here's the actual clustering, which is somewhat surprising to me. A lot of times, especially with categorical data, the, the clustering, I don't know, this is what it came out. So yes? The tuple that you assigned to do the assignment of the clustering, which column did you use for that? Or do you, do you do it, it uses the, um, the category utility takes into account all the columns. And it, it take, not only that, it takes both intra and inter uh, clustering effects into account. It, it, it's a really interesting metric, and there's been a lot of math done how this thing relates to other types of statistical things. But anyway, um, what happens here is that you can see, well, that's a pretty good cluster. And in fact, it's not really clustering by color. What does it appear to be clustering by mostly? Yeah, it seems to be doing this. Here's the shorts, here's the long. And that one's sort of a, uh, it just, just works, okay? Is coincidence, or is there something about the algorithm that's favoring that? You know, this is the type of thing when you're clustering categorical data, it's very difficult to know what's going on here. You know, it's just, there's no obvious, you can't draw a picture, there's no obvious intuition, at least to me. I mean, it seems to me that long is there because of green. Yes. Like, it's a secondary effect. But or true. 
<laughs> yeah, well, you got, I mean, see, the idea is, you know, if you put it here or here, you can see the clustering wouldn't be as good in some weird sense. Yeah. Did it pick the category that matched the number of clusters? Repeat that. It picks the category. The category had, that had the, number of, the same number of elements as clusters? I don't follow exactly. There's, three, oh, there's, there's four three. colors. Huh? Yeah. yeah, well, we have three clusters, and there are three options under link where there are two and four. Oh, I see, I see. Um, you know, I don't know if that is coincidence or not. I don't know. But you'll have the code so you can play around with it. It's kind of fun. Kind of. Yeah, here we are. Uh, kind of fun. Yeah, bring this home to your spouse or whatever. Hey, honey, I'm going to play around with the clustering. Yeah, God. Microsoft people. Um, OK, we're on the home stretch here. I have like, uh, I think, two slides left. The, um, this algorithm that I showed you, it turns out that in order to make it scale, to compute the category utility, you have to scan through the entire data set. So you're constantly trying this, you know, trying this uh, tentative assignment. And if you do that, you'd have an n squared, essentially, uh, algorithm. So the solution is to store things here. And I'll lead you to read the code. And it makes some of the data structures pretty tricky. But basically, if you can store the results of your previous assignment, then it becomes completely linear. You could do this in parallel as well, though, right? Free yeah, this would also parallelize. Parallelize, if that's a word. OK, um, we'll wrap things up here. There's a pointer to the uh, demo code. Um, our uh, advanced development team server in public. You'll see three folders there. It should be uh, easy to figure out. The next reference is the source of the fuzzy C-means clustering algorithm, if you want to know more information about that. This is the original reference of the category utility metric, if you want to know more about that. Oh, this one I put in. There was, um, um, while preparing for this talk, I got some uh, email messages. And one of the, um, uh, the person, I can't remember his name, he asked, what about a uh, clustering uh, on, in a MapReduce, Hadoop, Cosmos type environment. Um, that's one of the, the big research areas that's going on now. And I'll say that it turns out that there's no new algorithms. The approaches are to take similar things like you can do sampling, you know, stratified sampling and things like this. The best reference I found was here. It describes a particular technique, but the introduction of the paper gives a very good overview of the approaches you can take to clustering data in Cosmos in our world. Um, and then here's uh, something I wrote for MSDN Magazine. And that's my email. You're welcome to send me a uh, message. And that's all. I'm done. <laughs> Can I ask questions or go away? Or? So at the beginning, you said that visualizing the data is extremely powerful. Of course, as you pointed out as well, if you have 27 dimensional data, usually you can only visualize up to three. So, so which then brings you around to, like, with these examples, and I know it's trivial for illustration purposes, you can see that the result is working, right? But that notion of the, the sense of does it do the right thing must go away as the data gets more complex and harder to visualize to even know that it even works. So you're, you're absolutely right. You, there's, uh, there's a certain amount of uh, uneasiness involved with data clustering large amounts of data when you're done. It's very difficult to tell, does this data clustering make sense at all? Uh, in fact, one of our uh, researchers here, Rich uh, Karuna, on the third floor, is going to give a talk. I, I don't know if it's happened yet, but it addresses that topic uh, about data clustering and, and the difficulties in, in assigning meaning to it. I just paraphrased it, but I'm looking forward to that talk, too. I think it's going to be, does anyone know about that talk? Seen it? I think it's, I'll, I'll try to find out. But Well, look, look for Rich's talk on clustering. Yes? There was also, there is also some work on visualization large dimensionality data, and there was a talk here that the guy gave. So, a talk on large dimensionality visualization. This is one of our major areas here at MS Research. It's an area outside of my uh, field, but I've talked to people like that, especially when I was working with Cosmos data. And uh, th that's a whole different world, but I'm not sure. I, I think visualization is always a good thing. But at some point with data clustering, it stops becoming effective. You know, I think it's always used. It was a very fun talk. 
Okay, yeah, a good talk. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, always it fun because they usually have colors yeah. and stuff to look at. You know, our talks always end up being a console shell. You know, okay, we don't have much pizzazz. It was getting out of chocolate. Oh, <laughs> oh, they're giving. I'll have to remember that next time. Yes. Just a comment really on the dimensionality aspect of things because it must be very, very interesting to be able to say um, the data clusters um, with a reduced set of dimensions to a sufficient level, which means that I don't really have to look at these dimensions when, when determining my clustering. Um, and finding some way of saying, look at all the dimensions, but find effective clustering that uses the minimum number of those dimensions must be really, really interesting. Right, so I'll, I'll just sort of, uh, for the benefit of the, the audio, sort of paraphrase that. And in machine learning, this is a, a close cousin to feature selection, where we want to uh, try to simplify our life by identifying those columns in a high dimensional problem that are the most meaningful. And in fact, this paper actually talks about that as one of the approaches you can use on uh, very large amounts of data. So you can try to weed columns out or just deal with them one at a time. So talking about high dimensional data, uh, do you know of any good implementations of uh, sparse, uh, of clustering using sparse data? Clustering using sparse data. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that means. When I think sparse data, I, I translate to a sparse matrix where we have. Right. So now you're talking, so how, let me rephrase the question. What about, and this may be a completely different question, but what about data that has missing values? The columns have missing values. That could be considered sparse data, where the missing values. Now, that is one interpretation, but I don't think from your face that's what you had in mind. I think data where there's a lot of zeros, right? A lot of zeros. Okay, well, I will say that that, that is isomorphic to the uh, missing data thing. Um, I don't know... I haven't really uh, worked with that data or looked at it, to tell you the truth. So I'll have to say I don't know. Uh, the question is data clustering on sparse data, or we can rephrase that to say, would this be the same as saying clustering data where a column has is dominated by one particular value, zero or otherwise? I don't know. So I'll just say I don't know. Okay, I'm done. That's all. Go away. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you next time.